Great. Well, I have the top of the hour. It's 11 o'clock Mountain Time. Thank you so much for joining us. Looks like we have a good sized group with us today that will be able to still interact and engage. We'll have all 600 of you didn't show up, thankfully. So thank you for being here. I'm Megan Raymond with WCET. I direct programs and sponsorship and membership here at WCET. And this is our 33rd annual meeting. We're happy that so many of you could join us and we look forward to being face-to-face -face next year in, in November, or excuse me, in October in Denver. So this is our first of two pre-conference sessions and then tomorrow we kick off with the full session. So thank you so much for joining Accelerating the Adoption of Adaptive Courseware. Megan Tassin, she's from APLU. She is the director of the Personal Learning Consortium there. She's gonna lead the conversation today. So I'm gonna have her go ahead and kick it off. And as we go through today, if you have any questions, just go ahead and enter them into the Q&A interface and keep the conversation going in chat. It is recorded. As soon as we have a chance to get in and edit it and clean it up, we'll post it back to Feedloop and you'll have access to that through the end of the month. So please welcome Megan. Uh, thank you, Megan. Like there's an echo in here today. Um, assuming everybody can hear me since you're smiling to what I just said. Um, just want to say good morning and a good afternoon, depending on where you're dialing in from today, and welcome to today's presentation and pre-conference on adaptive learning at the 33rd Annual Conference. As Megan mentioned, I am Megan Tassin. I am the Director of the Personalized Learning Consortium at the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, which is based in Washington, D.C., and we're really glad that you could join us today. Um, in addition to providing an overview on what adaptive courseware is and what we're learning about it and its ability to support students success and equitable outcomes. We have several university leaders and experts, um, faculty and administrators with us today that are going to speak to the important work that they are doing on their own campuses and sharing their experiences and lessons learned. So we're going to be hearing about how folks are using data analytics to uh, support course design and student engagement, how institutions are supporting faculty to build community and adoption of evidence-based teaching practices, um, how these tools can also be used to improve the quality of the student experience, um, and then assessing student needs as well and integrating that into the design of curriculum. And then of course, strategies for scale of how this could be scaled at your institutions Some of the lessons that we've been learning from these institutions that we've been working with for quite some time. Uh, first, I do wanna take a moment to do introductions of our speakers before we jump into those presentations, um, which will be followed by a Q&A. So I encourage folks to uh, use the Q&A feature to enter your questions as they pop up in your mind. Um, however, those will be reserved for later um, at the end of the sessions after everybody's on and given their, their talks. Um, so if for our speakers, if you could please introduce yourself, um, what institution you're from and your role at your institution, we'd appreciate that. I'll just again say I'm director of the PLC at APLU. Uh, we work with institutions to support the adoption of educational technologies such as adaptive courseware to improve teaching and learning in gateway courses. That's primarily been our role. And I'm joined by my colleague, uh, Matt Wren. I'll let him just speak up real quickly and introduce himself and then we'll kick it over to our university university colleagues. Matt? Hi, good morning. Thanks, Megan. My name is Matt Wren. I'm a data analyst with APLU in the PLC, uh, and it's great to be with you all this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you live. And um, can I just tag team one, someone, Megan? Uh, yeah, it'd be Chuck and Patsy. Thanks. Oh, great. Patsy is next. Well, this is Chuck. Uh, hello, everyone. We're really glad to be here. I'm Chuck Jubin from the University of Central Florida. I'm the director of the Research Initiative for Teaching Effectiveness here at UCF, uh, long-term data analyst here at UCF and uh, director of the Rosen Foundation Scholarship Programs for the University. Hi everyone, I'm Patsy Moskal. I'm director of the Digital Learning Impact Evaluation here at UCF. And we've actually been evaluating adaptive uh, learning here since 2014. Thank you, Patsy. Uh, Connie and mm -hmm. RCTU folks. Thank you, Connie Johnson with Colorado Tech. I am the provost and will be serving sort of two roles in this presentation. One will be uh, the bridge of Chuck and Patsy's work at UCF. We do collaborative research uh, with UCF and CTU. So excited about that, but also uh, really delighted that some of our lead faculty who are working in adaptive learning maps will be uh, presenting as well. So Tanya. Hello, my name is Tanya Haas. I am with CTU also, 
As Connie mentioned, I'm one of the lead faculty online overseeing our mathematics courses. And hi, everybody. I'm Sarah Pingree. I'm also a lead faculty of mathematics at CTU. I've been working um, with adaptive learning in our mathematics courses for almost 10 years now. Thanks, Sarah. Um, and then Tanya Buchan and uh, Kim Hope from uh, Colorado State. Hello, everyone. My name is Tanya Buchan. I am an instructional designer in the Institute for Learning and Teaching at CSU. And I was the program manager for the adaptive coursework grant. Kim? And I'm Kim Hoke. I'm a professor in the Department of Biology at CSU. And I'm also the director of the Life Core program, which manages the introductory biology courses that students across campus take for various majors. Thank you so much, Kim. And Ryan. Hi, I'm Ryan Luke at the University of Louisville. I am currently a uh, professor in the Department of Mathematics, um, but formerly I, I served for several years as a program director role in our Center for Teaching and Learning, and I was also the director of our Adaptive Learning Grant. And um, to some extent, I still fulfill the role as the Adaptive Learning uh, Liaison across our university campus. And we very much appreciate that and you tagging in um, every time that we give you a call, Ryan and others, when we want you to join in on opportunities like this. So thank you to you as well as our other um, speakers and experts who've joined us today. Um, Megan uh, Raymond, if you could go ahead and actually just forward it two slides. I don't think we need that title slide. So just want to give you a little bit of context of uh, who the PLC is and some of the work that we've been doing kind of set us up uh, for these conversations with the institutions that we often work with. So since the PLC launched in 2013, our primary goal was to work with institutions to really understand how do you leverage digital learning and educational technologies um, in the classroom to improve the quality of teaching and learning, um, ultimately with the goal of improving student outcomes, particularly for minoritized student populations. Um, much of our work has actually in the last uh, five years or so has been funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and has focused around the adoption, implementation, and scale of adaptive courseware. We've got a list of 14 institutions that you'll see there that we've worked with um, for the last five years, some of them a little bit more recently, uh, that top line there. Um, so we have representatives from University of Louisville as well as Colorado State. That's that grant that Tanya and Ryan both mentioned that they helped manage. Um, that was a scaling grant. Those institutions were looking to adopt adaptive course into gateway courses, particularly in gen ed courses, and get up to 15% uh, enrollments on that. And then um, less of a research grant on, on the front end, but we did get a lot of really good data that Matt is diving into these days on that. So we're looking to learn from those experiences and share those. Um, the second grant uh, was adaptive uh, courseware for early success. And that's that lower list of um, institutions that you'll see listed there. And that was meant to um, learn from the lessons of that first grant, uh, offer some peer mentorship and coaching coaching and really work on identifying what some of the best practices are um, to support those institutions with those lessons learned so that they could adopt and scale uh, a lot quicker, um, provide them with the resources and capacity building to help them do this work um, at their own institutions. Um, each of these took a cohort approach where we worked with cross-functional teams at those institutions, uh, bringing them together to share and learn from each other. And we've learned uh, very much from this work. Uh, Megan, next slide. And one of those lessons, um, and one of the reasons why we work in gateway courses, uh, this won't come as a surprise to most folks who are kind of working in this space, is that gateway courses are still a critical barrier uh, for so many students, um, particularly um, students of color and low income students. There's continue to be significant um, inequities in uh, student success rates across these courses. Um, you know, and of course, this has an effect on uh, retention rates, students declaring majors, uh, their tuition costs, and how many student loans they're taking out, and them, you know, pursuing the uh, degrees that they want uh, to, to pursue and actually graduating. So we see this as a really critical area um, that can be, um, you know, addressed and supported um, to help those students, you know, realize their academic um, achievements and goals. And so one of our goals is to work with universities not only to adopt digital learning, but to redesign courses with equity in mind, really centering student needs and enri enriching their educational experiences. And we see adaptive courseware as one of the ways that you can actually do that. Uh, next slide, Megan. 
Right. So adaptive courseware, I'm not going to dive in too deeply on a, a full-fledged definition on it. I think uh, at this stage, most folks do have a general understanding of what it is. Obviously, it's an online courseware, right, um, with some AI capabilities that provide students. Um, one of the, I think, simplest ways that it's been put, I've heard from our colleagues over at Arizona State, where they say, um, you've got the right student with the right information at the right time, with the idea that these systems are supposed to provide students with what information they need based on their learning um, background and their skills uh, to get them to proficiency and it guides them through that process and then of course that's supported with quality pedagogy and teaching from their faculty um, and these have these systems have benefits not only to students and faculty, but also to the institutions. Uh, we've seen, especially when this work is scaled, uh, that it can support larger institutional goals, such around um, affordability, access, and retention. Um, it also improves student learning and student outcomes in these foundational courses. We do have evidence of that happening in our first grants and our ongoing grants. And then it provides richer student data um, than what is typically provided with textbooks, which it really isn't much data at all. Um, and that data can be integrated with an existing uh, infrastructure on uh, student analytics, for instance, advising, how can we take that information that we're learning in the classroom to help reach students in need um, faster, um, rather than at the end of the semester, for instance. There's also benefits to faculty, right? So these systems provide faculty with real-time data on how students are performing, what they're struggling with, what they're doing well in, um, and they can see how students are interacting with and understanding that course content, better positioning the faculty to teach um, in a way that meets students kind of where they're at, where those gaps are. If, uh, if there's an area that they're missing, they can dive deep into that um, and address those, those missing gaps. If there's an area that students are excelling at, dive even deeper right and do some more active engaging pedagogy in the classroom and spend time doing that um, it also helps do a little bit of ensuring your students are showing up to class um, having read the materials right um, i'm sure some of us are guilty of being those students at one point in our lives um, what is it like when your students you know can show up and they're prepared for class and that they've already been assessed on the content and you can dive a little bit deeper uh, there's also benefits to students uh, matt i'm going to go ahead and hand it off to you yeah Thanks, Megan. Um, so I was thinking about this slide this morning and I was trying to think of, okay, well, yes, we see all these reasons that this is beneficial to students, but like, why is that? And I was thinking, right, like in this time of Zoom and everything is online and everything is digital, right? Even we are taking advantage of these digital tools to help us connect and gather here today. Um, and so I think that like, this is even more true for students who technology is just such a critical and central part of their lives and it has been right so even from 10 years ago the students today are just more comfortable with digital tools and spaces than you know maybe most of us were in college for instance and so we know that you know digital and adaptive courseware technologies you know offer more interactive experiences than using textbooks and it allows them to get sort of immediate feedback and and um, help them learn in different ways um, but we also know that students move through courses differently and, and some students might not do well if they just have to sit in a course and listen to a professor talk for a certain amount of time and then go back and they don't have that content again for another week, let's say. And so they need that sort of tool they can constantly refer back to to help them learn. Um, but a big one for me is that is, is very important, I think, is that they also help them reduce course costs. So instead of having to buy a textbook or having to buy all these different materials, they might be able to pay one fee and have all that information at their disposal in a more digestible format. And so um, I think to me, the, the biggest thing to sort of keep in mind is I think this is an equity this is solving a, an equity challenge, right? Like we're providing students ways to learn on their own time and in their own way. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. If I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and so we're talking about students, we're talking about learning. And so I think it's really awesome to be able to hear from students directly and hear how this impacts their educational journeys. And so, um, um, can we, yeah, thanks. Just, want, just wanted to say um, that it's awesome just to be able to hear from students directly and hear that um, these, these tools really do help students with not only their performance in classes, but their confidence and that they can really learn and study on their own time and in their own way. And I think that's really cool. So now if I could have the next slide, thank you. Um, so what does all that mean, right? So um, we've, we've referenced this adaptive scaling grant a couple different times and just to sort of provide a very high level overview, um, we worked with eight institutions, some of which are represented on this call, um, from 2015 to 2020, um, collecting data on, um, can I go back just for one second? Thank you. Um, on different courses. We, so we looked at over 200 courses at these eight institutions um, 
as they implemented adaptive technologies uh, in the courses and sort of tracking what that meant for students over time. And so one of the biggest takeaways we found is that it really helped impact um, course success rates, so pass rates right in these courses. And so you can see that um, just in the span of four years, courses that implemented adaptive technologies um, increased 13% in just four years from the baseline. And so that was a really awesome um, finding that we saw from this first grant. Um, but if you could go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, another really awesome takeaway that we found is that this is saving students a lot of money. And so, so because students are passing these courses at higher rates, they're not having to repeat courses in order to um, continue in their degree completion or their degree progress. And so um, we saw, you know, that because there's an average increase uh, in course pass rate of about 8% with, with these technologies, um, about 8,700 students passed courses um, in the last year of the grant that they might not have passed without adaptive. And that translated into uh, over $16.5 million in tuition dollars saved. Um, and so that was just a really awesome way for us to be able to say that, you know, not only are we helping students learn better in their own way, but this actually is really helping students um, save time and save money, which again, I think really addresses the equity um, problem that we're seeing with, you know, degrees taking maybe longer than they should. Um, and so that was just sort of a high level overview of the work that we've done, but I'm eager to hear from some of our colleagues that were actually on the ground doing this work um, later today in our panel. And I'll hand it back to Megan. So just real briefly, and so through the two grants that we've been working on with these institutions, there are a lot of common themes, and you're going to be hearing about some of these things um, today from our institutions, but I just want to highlight a few of these things, and that is first being that this work takes time, uh, effort, energy, and resources. Um, oftentimes, the first um, iteration of this um, at one's, in one's class or at one's institution, we typically don't see a significant um, increase in pass rates. Typically, it takes about three, uh, which uh, those are of you who teach know that that's typically kind of the standard and, and kind of getting your groove in your course. Um, so we see that to be the case as well. Um, but once time has passed and some of these scaling efforts have taken place, that's when we start to actually see some of those, those bigger numbers and for instance, passing rates and savings to students. Uh, we're also learning that there's no one size fits all model to implementation. There are certainly things that can be adopted and we can learn from our colleagues, but uh, institutional um, faculty, student and community context of what's going on the ground, what resources you do you currently have available or that you don't, all of these things kind of come into play in terms of what's the best approach for doing this work. Um, and then also just this eye on continuous improvement, the sort of notion of we've never fully refined our pedagogy, we're always kind of working on it a little bit and looking for ways that we can continuously improve, um, you know, what's working, what's not working, how do I teach better, how do I better reach my students, how can we better support our students in the classroom, but also for our academic leaders, how can you better support faculty to take on this work? Because it can be a heavy lift, especially on that front end. And then to maintain, sustain, and, and scale that work, um, having their support is, is really key. And then the last thing I just want to emphasize is that, um, you know, we, we often take the approach APLU is that there's no quick fix, there's no tool. We don't take a techno solutionist approach to this work. Um, adaptive courseware is a, is a good tool, but it needs to be paired with quality um, course design and instruction. And without uh, quality faculty and, and quality pedagogy, this simply will not work. Um, and then of course, having the support of the institution to really help faculty do this work and scale this within their programs on their, in their courses and on their campuses. That's when we really see those big leaps. Um, so I'll go ahead and pause there and we're gonna hand things off to our institutional leaders. I believe we're starting with UCF with Chuck and Patsy. So I'll go ahead and uh, hand the slide deck over to you. Uh, Megan, you wanna go ahead and forward that? Oh, sorry, shameless plug. Can you go back two more for me? Uh, we are hosting <laughs> um, an event uh, December 1st where we'll be hearing from uh, six uh, four-year institutions as well as seven two-year community colleges were part of our most recent grant work. Um, again, hearing about some of the lessons learned of how they've been starting this work, sustaining this work, and uh, how they're going to be continuing this moving forward with equity in mind. So thank you. Well, I guess it's up to us now at UCF. Uh, great introduction, Megan and Matt. It was really, really good. And Megan, I um, again, I'm Chuck Dubin from the University of Central Florida, and I'm terrified now because I heard Patsy say we've been doing this for 14 years, and I'm a fan of the Oscar Wilde quote, if I had more time, I'd written a shorter note. So how we're gonna condense seven years of work into 15 minutes is really scaring me. But Megan, I really did 
have an interesting comment when you said about uh, adaptive learning and knowing, you know, where they are in the course when they come in for a for a course session. I've always said in my uh, multivariate courses, owning the book is not enough. You really do have to read the book uh, in terms of going ahead and understanding this. So that's good. But thank you for attending. We're really glad you're here. Um, and I'm a little nervous too because UCF is the cover band for this concert. You know, we're opening, and if this our our numbers don't go well, it's going to be bad for the rest of the performers. So we'll try to do our best for here. Okay, these virtual virtual workshops are tough. You know, we've all been doing them for now two years. They really are difficult. Um, and we we're having a conversation in the planning session about trying to do face to face back in conferences with masks and how difficult that is. So. Um, we're, we'll, we'll do the best for you that we can. The way we're going to work it is I'm going to do the speaking and Patsy's going to handle the chat. During my talking, Patsy will seed the chat with all kinds of resources which, to which I'll be referring to. So Patsy will be manning that chat and this is the way we usually work it. I'm too old and slow to keep up with the chat. So Patsy will be covering me as we go through this and we work on this and see this, okay? So we'll be doing that. Um, the other thing is I'll be mentioning a number of books. And when I mention them, I'd like you to know that um, the Chuck notes are available for these books. That, you know, when I mention the book, uh, we, we're very careful about the books that we read and how we take notes on them. And they're all available to you. So I will say this and Patsy will say this to you. Anything we have, you're welcome to it. You can have it all. UCF gives it all away. So you're more than welcome to it. The first book I will mention is a great book by Stephen Johnson called Where Good Ideas Come From. And in that book, he makes a conclusion like this. There are three basic components to good ideas. One is the adjacent possible. There are 90 of you in, 91 of you in this workshop. And as you begin listening to us, as you move into the adaptive learning area and you have all kinds of choices for platforms, the first thing you have to look at is what is the adjacent possible? What is the next reasonable thing I can do? Megan already talked about that. It's a long grind. It's a slow hunch, which is the second thing. It takes a long time. She mentioned the cycle of three. It may be longer than that. And the last thing that's important is a liquid network. Don't try to do this alone. Don't do this alone. It won't go well for you. Trust me, you need a liquid network. You know, Johnson in his book, is hilarious because he talked about Britain. When they finally discovered coffee and tea, they stopped drinking alcohol. So the Brits were no longer drunk and they went into the coffee houses. Instead of taking depressants, they took stimulants. And this explosion of ideas happened because they were talking to each other. And that's critically important. This is UCF. The good news is we're growing. What's the bad news? The bad news is we're growing. You know, we grow, 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 grow. Now we're at 70,000 students. We have entered something called phase transition. We are so big that there is no way we can ever build an infrastructure to keep this going. So obviously online learning is one aspect of it, but you've already heard Matt and Megan talk about equity problems, access problems, all of those. So even with online learning, Adaptive learning begins to address those kinds of things. And I'll try to speak to that as we go on. Shameless plug. Megan, you gave a shameless plug. I'm going to give you one too. Patsy and I are now doing a book on analytics and adaptive learning. And we are now looking for chapters, right, Patsy? So any of you listening today, you've got some good work you've been doing. We would be more than interesting and have interested in your submitting a proposal for a chapter. You know, we've got some really good commits so far, but this is important And think about this. There is a natural connection between adaptive learning and analytics. We just have to flush it out. There is something going on there and we have to know about that. So the phase transition in your institutions, adaptive learning will have for that. Oh, I love this. Next slide. It worked. I love it when it works, the slides. Okay. Based on what you heard today and what I just said, um, I want you to work together. APLU has been trying to get institutions to work together. It's not the easiest thing in the world. Institutions are not trained to work together. 
Everything we do on the athletic field is a competition. Now we're supposed to work together. Three institutions got together in an emergent relationship. In complexity theory, there's something called emergent relationships. That is, the ensemble is more than the sum of the parts. Uh, Nassim Taleb, in a great book called Skin in the Game, describes that in terms of ant colonies. Emergent relationships just happen from the bottom up. They already do. You can study 100 ants for your entire career, but you'll never understand an ant colony doing that. Ant colonies emerge. The interactions are more important than the individual components. This is what happened in this partnership. UCF, CTU, and Realize It, our adaptive learning platform provider, got together through happenstance at a conference. Connie and Chuck liked each other. Patsy and Connie liked each other. Colin Howland from Realize It liked us both. And we began talking and we said, hey, it's very interesting. We have complementary strengths and weaknesses, okay? We can do applied research at UCF. We can do educational innovation at CTU. And we can do theoretical research at, um, C at Realize It. So now what we have is this emergent relationship. We can all do things. We can all cover things that each other can't do. And we work together. And Connie will tell you more about how it's worked. And it's worked out very well. Um, and it's a good sign. There are still 90 in here. So you need to be looking for partners. You need to be looking for partners to work on this. It is not a simple problem, but it just happens. It emerges. And that's what happens. Complexity theory is the new frontier. Trust me on this. It really is. This is sounds simple. It is not. There is complexity. Okay, next slide. <laughs> Very often in education, it is my judgment that what we do is come up with a solution and then we begin looking for a problem. You say, we got a solution. Now we're looking for a problem. I think you have to really ask yourself, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Um, <laughs> And then I think and the other thing you have to ask yourself, and this is going to sound like heresy, is adaptive learning for everyone? Probably not. Probably not. I think there are contexts where it is more and less effective. And as you proceed in your institutions, I think almost every institution that you will hear from today will tell you there are situations where it works better and there are situations where it doesn't work nearly as well. Not every student is geared for, factor, for adaptive learning. Not every faculty responds particularly well to adaptive learning. You have to maximize those possibilities. That is really something that is very important. The context is that what is the problem we are trying to solve? For us, this is the problem. Next slide, please. In college algebra at UCF, the chance of um, non-success in college algebra has been 41%. You know, Megan, you talked about that. Gateway courses, gateway courses. What does that tell you? It tells you the odds of passing college algebra at UCF is only marginally better than even. It is a little bit better than flipping a coin. If I take any one student in college algebra and say, what are their chances of graduating? It's even. Clearly, that's not acceptable. Clearly, that's not acceptable. So what can we do of changing those odds? Here is our purpose in adaptive learning. We're trying to do two things in analytics. We're trying to remove obstacles, and we're trying to increase the odds of success. We have found, okay, we have found that analytics trying to predict one-to-one -one student success is not particularly acceptable, successful. We have found that the best you can do is in terms of cohorts. We're back to the problems. Both this is not a singular problem. Megan and Matt both talked about that. The equity problem. I'm going to pile onto that problem. And Connie Johnson says, I'm depressing. Here's the way I'm going to depress you. 
If you live in the lower economic quartile in the United States of America, your chance of going to and graduating from college is 10%. That's from the Pell Institute. The odds against you are nine to one. Those are horrible odds. And we haven't done really well with removing those odds. This is what we're trying to do here at UCF. The other thing Matt mentioned was debt. I'm going to say this to you. The total college debt in the United States of America today is $1.7 trillion. Can you wrap your head around that number? If that were GDP, that would be the 11th largest economy in the world. It's mind boggling. Okay? A billion dollars is a thousand million dollars. A trillion dollars is a thousand billion dollars. Okay? A trillion dollars is a thousand billion dollars. So right now we are, in terms of millions, 7.5 million million dollars in debt in this country. College debt has ruined the American dream, has taken the American dream away. That with healthcare, they're both, okay. So there's a great book by Mula Nathan and Schaefer called Scarcity, more good Chuck notes. If you read this book, what you see is students living in poverty are juggling lots of things, family, children, working, cars, transportation, family, everything. They're, they've got a million balls in the air and they come to a college campus and they miss a class. Then they miss another one and they're gone. They're gone. The whole set of dominoes falls. What's a better alternative, adaptive learning, where they can work at their own rate and manage their time? Next slide, please. The adaptive equation. Okay, I'm gonna tell you this is not new. If you haven't read it, there's a paper by John Carroll in the Teachers College Record in 1963. It's well over 50 years old where John wrote this equation, the adaptive learning equation. If time is held constant, learning will be the variable, okay? But if learning is the constant, learning time will be the variable. So that means if you stick everybody in a college algebra course for one semester, what they're going to learn is going to be a variable. If what they're going to be learning is a constant, the semester blows up. Think about that. That's the fundamental principle of adaptive learning. And that's what we're working on at UCF. If you haven't read that paper by John Carroll, you must. That's a Chuck assignment. You've got to do it. How am I doing on time? Okay. I got to hurry. I'm terrified now. I'm running late, scared, old, slow. Next slide. All right. When you're looking at this, you're, it was already mentioned again. Megan and Matt took all my slides. You have real-time data. When you begin doing analytics, you have two choices from variable domains. One is the, the SIS, Student Information Systems stuff the SAT, the ACT, high school, you know what I'm talking about. That's all of your institutions, that's all there, okay? In adaptive learning with Realize and others, you have a lot of real-time data. Your baseline, your module scores, your modules completed, engagement, interaction, revision, practice, knowledge growth. You have these two domains. So what you do, let them duke it out. Let them fight it out. See what you get, what the best predictor is. Okay, can you advance the slide for me? And the winner is always GPA. Grade point average is always the best predictor of success in the class, historical academic performance. It is by far, it wipes out every other variable. That is great. It's a great predictor. What's the problem with it? It's catch-22. You remember Yusarian in catch-22? He didn't want to fly, but the only way you couldn't fly is if you were crazy. But if you didn't want to fly, you couldn't be crazy. That was catch-22. This is catch-22. The best predictor is the one you can do least about. You can't change people's academic history. You can't do it. You can't do it. So you need to 
segue to those real-time variables provided by you in adaptive learning. So the next slide. If you take GPA and you declassify it, declassification is a very important tool in this, and you work in your analytics. Those people in college algebra at UCF in the lowest GPA quartile have a chance of graduating 26%. The odds against them are three to one. They virtually have no chance. Those in the upper academic quartile have an 88% chance. Their odds are three to one in favor. You see how different it is? So what are we going to do about this? So next slide, please. Here's what I do. There's something we do here at UCF called classification and regression trees. It's really good. Basically. It tortures the data until it confesses. And here's what we were able to do. Now, if you're in that quartile, 74% chance of your failing, and you're an adaptive learning course, and we looked at those other variables, and you are in quartile two, three, or four in revision history. That is, how hard you work revising your materials in your adaptive learning college algebra course, and you're in quartile four for engaging in total time for your engagement in the course, your chance of non-success drops from 74% to 39%, better than even better than the than we began. That's the best we can do. But think about this, taking students who have no chance to giving them a better than even chance. And the thing about this, revision and total time are both teachable. We have now integrated them into the course. They are surrogates. They are surrogate variables where we teach students about proper revision techniques and proper use of time. And it works really quite well, finding surrogate measures that work for you. Next slide. Here's what we've gained. How much lift can you get from the UCF model? Here's the lift. 35% in that lowest quartile, 15% in the middle quartiles, and virtually no lift in the upper quartile. That's cool, but you don't need any lift in the upper quartile. Those people don't need any analytics. They don't need any help. You know. Where it's needed are the people that Megan and Matt talked about. And we've been very successful with that, working with a combination of analytics and adaptive learning. I've gone too long. I'm going to hurry. Here we go. Next slide. Here's what Colin Holland did with Realize It working with us. He, our stuff has always been static after the fact. We did all this when the course was over. Colin did it real time and found something very interesting. Early warning indicators change their value over time. And you'll see there's little arrows. Some of them go down. Some of them go up. Next slide. Here are all the variables that I showed you. Here's what column showed. At the beginning of a course, total time involved is very important. By the end of the course, it's not nearly as important. The thing that's important is that the predictive lift of the variables changes value and power over the course of the course. It changes. They, the what predicted at the beginning doesn't predict as nearly as well. It's a dynamic model. And the last thing I'll show you is this. Now I'm going to segue to Connie. Here's what he found. Connie, I'm going to segue to CTU. Here's what Colin found for CTU. Their courses are five and a half weeks. Column found that the lift they get with this model doesn't happen until the third week. But the problem with the third week is the course is 60% over. So it is very difficult to make this work in a time-shortened course. It's much easier in um, a 16-week semester. Okay, I've gone too long. I apologize, but we'll do the best we can. All these materials are available. We'd love to work with you. Come visit us. It's snowing there. It's not snowing here. Come see us. Connie.
All right. So Megan, did you want to say anything? You want me to just jump down nope. in? Jump right in, Connie. Okay. So um, I always love uh, working with and hearing Chuck and also with Patsy, who keeps our resources all together. But Chuck's mentioned some very important points uh, that I want to continue on that we learned from our research. If we want to go to the next slide. Uh, in, in summary, what did the data inform us? Well, Chuck just said it, time matters. What was really different, and this is something for you to think about, is how long is your course? CTU has an accelerated model. Uh, for those of you not familiar with Colorado Tech, 25,000 or so students, mainly working adults, uh, compressed five and a half week sessions with students taking one course, maybe two at a time, but it is a short period of time. And you'll hear about how that impacted math and how, the, how our faculty worked on our learning maps in just a bit, but time matters. And we learned that from the research. We also learned that students had different ways to engage with the material. And so some students, and we did some prototypes, uh, were uh, basically steady eddies, you know, just hop in through the material, uh, like the turtle. And then we had other students who waited, 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 boom, went at the end and other students did a little bit and then a lot. And so what we also learned is that the time that students spend in the courses matter too. If students were spending the time in the adaptive courses, they were doing well, but some students were doing it differently. They were cramming till the very end. And so time matters, student engagement matters, faculty engagement matters. You know, I, I'm, I'm here and I'd pound the, I'm pounding my, my desk here saying, you have to spend time, students have to spend time with the tools. The other thing that we learned, and this is probably more from our own data, we have a CTU Messenger, which is basically a text tool, which I'm delighted to say we went an outstanding uh, work of last year, the COVID response work for CTU Messenger. And we were hearing students experience real time through our content. And students were telling us, I can't figure this out. I don't know where to go. Where does this map? What, what, what do I do here? And so we are really focusing now on user experience of students, not only of the tool itself, the adaptive tool itself, but how does it align in your LMS, your learning management system? If a student clicks onto content, do they get taken out of your learning management system? Do they come back in? All of those ended up being real uh, barriers if the courses weren't set up and then correct, not set up correctly, but if a student had trouble figuring things out initially. And then another tip I'd give you is that uh, we were all ready to jump into content right in unit one, right away. Students were not. They were like, how do I figure out how to do this? So that went to the user experience is that don't make the assumption students know how to use these tools. Once they do, it's great. And then they move through. But I think sometimes we make the assumption that uh, it, it's just all plug and play for students. And we learned pretty quickly we needed to create a number of help guides. Also, uh, and that then led to improvements in our orientation for new students, where we began talking about you'll use digital tools uh, and how what that looks like. To give you an idea of our scope and scaling, uh, we have about 160 courses using adaptive learning. We've had thousands of students using the technology. We've been at this since 2013. And so um, what we know is that the content matters. So as you're designing courses, students are looking for interesting content. They're looking for something relevant. They're looking for all of the things that you think about in a lecture course. They really need that and want that in adaptive learning too. And then also we diversified how we were approaching con content. So we didn't just have, okay, here's a video, here's text, here's their questions. We started having matching exercises in the content, or maybe it was going out to a case to uh, review a website or watch a video, but we, we really began uh, changing up the content in our adaptive courses. Next slide. And what about faculty? This is always a big topic. Uh, faculty, we began initially by a mandatory training for faculty to use the adaptive technology. It didn't take that long, but they had to complete the training prior to teaching an adaptive learning course. That I think is different than some institutions where we said, no, I'm, you have to go through the training. 
And, but we learned is that faculty said we need more training. And so as we went through this exercise, we actually pulled the faculty quite a bit to say, what is that that you need? And they, some said, I want specialized training modules. Some said, I wanna to talk to somebody on the phone while I'm on the computer so I can go through this. Some said, I want a practice session. And while we couldn't probably accommodate all requests, we took the, we had the mindset when we were scaling that we're not just going to say, oh, it's faculty and there they are asking for something else. And I'm sorry if I, I don't mean to offend any faculty, but sometimes administrators do say these things. And we were like, we're going to be open to all faculty and what they, what they um, want and try to provide them the tools they want. Because what we knew is the second point in here, that adoption of the uh, adaptive learning is greatly influenced by faculty engagement. And if faculty were thinking this stinks, I'm part of this pilot, I was told one time I was voluntold to do this, um, they're not going to engage in a positive way. And so we really work diligently in training and being responsive so that faculty felt supportive. The other thing that we did is we, and we still do this, is reviewed faculty survey on the content and said, okay, we might need to make a revision here. We've got to look and see how this is, um, this is designed. And so we really talked to faculty quite a bit about, about um, the content. So those are overall what we did at Colorado Tech. And I'm delighted to uh, introduce our two lead faculty who, who really I would submit are some of, of real experts in adaptive learning and mathematics. Um, and uh, we have, adaptive learning in a number of math courses. I'll tell you some have gone better than others, just to be candid. But through that, uh, uh, our professors have learned how to work and design. And so that's what you'll hear next is what we did with math. So next slide. And I'm not sure if it's Tanya or Sarah, but uh, floor is all yours. Thank you, Connie. So Sarah and I are going to discuss some of the changes that we've made to our adaptive learning maps in our introduction to college mathematics course. And we really tried to focus on engaging struggling students. Yes, thank you. So the majority of our students were successful in our introduction to college mathematics course, but we're going to focus on those struggling students. Students liked our adaptive learning platform. We saw that in those student comments, those messages, but what about those students that disengaged from the course? We saw that students that were behind in week three, like Chuck mentioned, are around 60% timeframe. They felt like it was a point of no return, that they could never catch up. What happened and how could we get those students back into the classroom? So what did we do? As Sarah mentioned, we read student messages in our wonderful CTU Messenger tool. And we'll share a few of those on the slides as we go along today. We also reviewed course data to see what our students were falling behind. And additionally, several of our lead faculty had the opportunity to live the student experience. We were enrolled in a class to gain a better understanding of the student experience. We read the content, completed assignments, met deadlines. All of this led to us revamping our adaptive learning platform focusing on content and assessment. Next slide, please. Thank you. So our first observation was that our AL lessons were connected very linearly. You see on the bottom left, you can see how linear they were originally. Each weekly assignment had to be completed to open the next week's assignment. This ensured that students had the prerequisite knowledge required to progress but we wondered if our connections were true prerequisites. When reviewing our course data, we noticed that struggling students could not open these future lessons to demonstrate their knowledge. So were we disengaging students who may have shown interest or demonstrated success in a future lesson? Right, so what did we do? We rebuilt the course learning map, as you can see the map on the right. We reviewed each lesson and connected them with those true prerequisite lessons. Now students don't have to complete an assignment 
to access the next week's assignment, they only need to complete a few key lessons to give them that prerequisite knowledge necessary to progress. Students have ample opportunity now to demonstrate their knowledge every week, explore those key weekly topics, but also access lessons that may interest them. Next slide, please. So next we observed that some of our lessons in the AL content included more than one concept. This is great because concepts do relate together, but we could tell by reading those student comments that maybe this traditional approach was blocking those struggling students. Too many concepts in one lesson were just overwhelming. This got us thinking. Were all the concepts in one lesson necessary for those post-requisite lessons? Could we make sure that the AL system was testing students on more than one concept in a lesson? So what did we do? We split the lessons into smaller chunks, an example of which can be seen on our slide. Content chunk chunking, as we all know, breaks down the lessons into more manageable pieces for our students. So yes, now we have more lessons, but students are completing the lessons and progressing in the course. So with these shorter lessons, we can ensure students gain the knowledge needed, but we don't have as many students struggling on the additional concepts that they don't truly need to move on to the next lesson. Next slide, please. So next we observed that every lesson did not contain relevance. Each weekly assignment contained relevance, but usually not until the end of the lesson. This is a traditional approach. In mathematics, we often present the concept and then follow it with an application. But does this traditional approach work best for our struggling students? Students tend to engage more when they understand the use or the relevance of a concept. Answer that question we've all heard before, why do I have to know this? Where will I ever use this? So yeah. we thought maybe we need to add more relevance into lessons near the beginning of the assignment. That's right, so what did we do? We added relevance to every lesson and in the assessment questions to keep students engaged in the course. I mean, this doesn't mean that every question is now a math word problem. Instead, there's a combination of those word problems and problems that are just set in a real world context. Students now see degree program relevance in every lesson and can see how the concepts are important to them. Next slide, please. Next, we observe that students were practicing lessons to improve their grade by answering more and more assessment questions, but they were engaging again in the content. I mean, practicing in a math course is great, but for struggling students, not engaging again in the content meant that they were not successful in answering those questions, would get frustrated, stop engaging altogether. Some students that succeeded on a lesson would actually keep practicing as well, not realizing that they should move on. Some of these students would disengage even though they were doing relatively well. What did we do? We removed that practice option, but we kept a revision option for our students. When students revise a lesson, they have to go back into the material. They have to review the concept first, then they can move on to the assessment questions. Students are spending more time engaging in the content and learning. Then they're also more successful in the assessments. This helps our struggling students finish lessons and progress in the course. Next slide, please. So finally, we observed that the best next step for a struggling student as they navigated through the assignment was not always obvious. As you saw in one of our first slides, we displayed the lessons as a map and we displayed all of the connections. The students could choose their own path through the available lessons, but some of our struggling students still could not judge that best next step. These students were unsure of which lessons were completed 
which lessons were locked, and which lessons were available to them to work on next. Right, so what did we do? We changed the display from a map to a list, as you can see here, and hid all of those connections. The lessons are also clearly labeled with learn, a check mark for completed lessons, a lock for locked lessons. So now students can easily go through the list from top to bottom and know exactly what they need to do next. So thanks so much for hearing about how we revamped our AL course for our struggling students. Thank you so much, both Sarah, Tanya, and Connie. And I really liked hearing about how you were centering and redesigning around student needs. It's always good to see examples of that in action. All right, next we're gonna learn about uh, faculty uh, communities and, and the support that uh, Colorado State uh, is providing to help kind of build that um, support for faculty and professional development on their campus. Uh, Tanya and Kim. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, so yes, so we had this opportunity to try to accelerate the adoption of courseware and scale it. And it was very exciting. Um, at the end, we had over 20% of our uh, courses that met the grant criteria using adaptive courseware. Um, and so when we did this, what we were really focusing on was aside from courseware selection, and I was um, program manager and in an instructional design role. So we um, looked for faculty that were willing to work with us. And so we worked with courseware selection. Um, and then with that, we thought it was really important to do some backwards course design to make sure that the courseware was meeting the outcomes for the course. Um, and it was just an opportunity for us to really kind of dive deep with faculty in the design of their course. And then the other piece of it, though, is that we felt like just adding courseware wasn't enough. We really wanted to partner with faculty um, to help them incorporate research-based teaching practices, um, high-impact practices, active learning, all sorts of those types of things. And so as we were working with faculty, um, we kind of found that when we did our individual consultations, that they were asking a lot of the same types of questions and had similar types of challenges. And so while we could share, hey, we, you might want to talk to, you know, Professor X over in math or wherever it might be um, about that, you know, we, we felt like it was, in, it was important to bring them all together. And so this is where we had this idea that really pulling together a community of practice um, would be helpful because they can hear from us, but they really want to hear about other people in the same role um, and facing the same types of challenges. So next slide, please. And so if you're not familiar with a community of practice, it's really just bringing together a group of folks that um, have similar problems, similar concerns, or passionate about a particular topic. And it's really an opportunity for them to all grow um, front and learn from each other, share their expertise, and, and doing this kind of regularly. So in our situation, we brought faculty together in the larger group two or three times in the semester to um, do that. So next slide, please. Thank you. So just super quick in the chat, I would love to see a few of you maybe mention what types of groups or communities of practice do you have in your campuses? or what types of topics do they address? Ours was centered around adaptive courseware and teaching um, and research-based teaching practices, but it'd be interesting to see what others might have them focused on. Okay, Active Learning Academy. Oh, that sounds, that's a great way to phrase that. Um, STEM Academy for faculty that are focused on STEM. Um, a new faculty one, that's really nice. They can help support each other, maybe bring in other faculty to be mentors. So thank you. Um, also adjuncts, yes, they, they have their own special needs. So it's nice for them to have a way to work with each other. Um, so next slide. So when we brought our faculty together, um, really we had a few goals, was to have faculty share both successes and challenges related to courseware. Um, we also 
wanted to ha um, have them work and collaborate on problem solving. Um, and that might even be related to either platform selection, um, how you might integrate the courseware into your courses, and even just grading practices, and then looking at the dashboard, because that learning about the different types of dashboards and the data that they would provide um, could be a challenge. So it also was an opportunity then for faculty to also come up with interventions and share those. Um, we also, one nice thing is that it really brought together faculty from different disciplines across campus and hearing that, oh, wow, you know, actually our microeconomics faculty might have some similar challenges to our physics faculty. And it was also an opportunity then for us as instructional designers to provide some just-in-time professional development for them. We would try to determine the time of the semester, so maybe what we might want to help them with. Um, and then the other way that we used this actually was as a way to recruit prospective faculty. Um, when they first heard about adaptive courseware, they may or may not have even had an idea of what it was. So we would invite them to our faculty um, community of practice, and that way they could really dive in, listen to the conversations, talk teaching, and um, I think we're losing Tanya. Yeah, we lost Tanya for a second. Oh, there she is. She's back. Oh, oh no. Um, next slide, please. Right, we got your back up here too, if you need. Okay. Oh. Yes, I have a message. My internet is unstable, so hopefully it'll stay stable. Um, so some of the meeting topics, we really, what we tried to do was outline um, the timing of the semester. And, you know, so we had an early semester meeting, a mid semester meeting and an end of semester meeting. And this um, table that's on here, I'll give you the resource here in a few minutes if you want to see this because I know it's a little small. Um, but we really tried to meet faculty where they were and we would even ask faculty what would be helpful next time for us to share with everyone um, during this and the other thing that we did aside from trying to anticipate where faculty might be in terms of the flow of the semester of using the courseware when we were looking at some of the teaching practices that we were asking faculty to try out some of the active learning and things like that. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to pilot um, this teaching effectiveness framework, some of that content that we were working on in TILT um, and share that with faculty and kind of bounce some ideas and hear their thoughts. So with that, um, I'm going to turn it over to Kim um, Hoke, who was one of our fabulous faculty who went through this journey with us. Thanks. So um, I attended quite a few faculty collaboration meetings. I, I wasn't present from the very start, so I missed some of the earliest content. But uh, basically, the way Tanya and her colleagues would structure things was that almost always the faculty meetings were scheduled as either breakfast or lunch meetings. So there'd be a shared meal. And that would not only mean that we got food, but in, and didn't need to find food elsewhere, but it also led to a sort of informal gathering where you'd be sitting at the table with other faculty interacting. Um, this, these meetings also in general were aligning with campus initiatives related to student success. And so the, these meetings promised to give us some tools to help with these broader campus initiatives. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one of the real benefits for me was the opportunity to have cross-discipline collaboration. And I'll go through a couple of examples. Uh, so we would talk to faculty in the room with us, and also the meetings automatically were self-selecting for people who really cared about modern ped pedagogy and like to try new things in their classroom. And it, it did lead to some really interesting long-term collaborations that were not directly related to the original goals of the TILT instructional designers. Um, in my department, we have a large team. We teach a lot of introductory biology classes and have multiple instructors. But there are other departments where there might only be one faculty member who's in charge of these new initiatives, gateway courses. 
Um, and these meetings did give an opportunity for those faculty to work with others. So we would often sit like at a table with the other biology instructors, and there might be someone expressing, well, I would love to have colleagues in my department to share these ideas with. So at least in these context of these meetings, those one-off faculty members alone in their department uh, had somebody to bounce ideas off of. And then finally, as Tanya mentioned, the meetings were set up such that we actually experienced these new teaching practices as a learner. And this was really essential for me. I don't necessarily get the same amount of understanding of how you would implement a particular uh, new experience student active learning exercise uh, if I do it by reading. And here I could go into class I go into the meeting and essentially be in the classroom as a student. And in five minutes, I would get the gist of how this would work. And I would start having all these ideas about how I could implement this myself. So the, I, I knew that every meeting was gonna give me this opportunity. And that was really valuable just to give ideas for what new things I could try. Next slide, please. So I just want to briefly tell you some of the offshoots that came of this for me and my team. Uh, so as part of this initiative, the LIFE 102 and 103 introductory biology lecturers began a collaborative working group. And essentially when I started teaching in introductory biology, we never, all the, there were 12 instructors or 15 instructors who contributed to this series and we never had been in the same room together to talk about this. But as part of this APLU grant, we began regular meetings with the instructors to originally identify the best ways to incorporate the courseware into classes. But it really had a lot of positive side effects and we continue to meet to this day. So as part of this uh, effort, we started thinking about the consistency of the content that we cover across classes. And we ended up writing 100 chapter level learning objectives, more than 100 chapter level learning objectives. The first few shown here, basically all instructors are teaching this content uh, and they all agreed to teach this content. And this is the core content. Instructors can have their own personal learning objectives they love to add. But this core central set really led to greater consistency across courses, and it facilitated other uh, resources aligned with those learning objectives. So when we could no longer have in-class exams, we set up a shared test bank in Canvas with five questions or more aligned with each learning objective. And we could share new in-class activities we were planning, and again, relate them easily to the specific learning objectives. Next slide, please. Another offshoot was actually a cross-disciplinary collaboration in which there, the people teaching in life in the biology series and the people teaching in the introductory chem series kind of found each other and realized we had a lot in common, including a lot of the same students who need to take both series and struggle. And we've realized that we could work together to help address some common student mis misconceptions. So this summer we formed a group and we met over the summer, we reviewed each other's learning objectives and reviewed relevant slide decks. So the introductory biology chemistry content is all in a few weeks. And um, the chemistry content is spread throughout the semester. And we met and uh, came up with a system where we would realize potential misconceptions being promoted or at least not uh, avoided in, in our slides. And we jointly created explanatory sets of slides. These were resources for the faculty, but in some cases, this will allow the same content to be referenced using the same slides in the two courses where in, usually the students hear about it in biology first, and then now the student, the professors in chemistry can refer back to that biology content. Say, now we're gonna dive a little deeper into this. Uh, so the, we both found this extremely valuable and, um, and a really great offshoot of this community of practice. 
again, unintended consequence of just bringing people together and realizing we had shared challenges and in this case, shared students. Next slide. So uh, a group of us put together a guide to building a faculty learning community that Tanya mentioned earlier. Uh, and we provided some resources, including that list of topics and sort of general suggestions for how to implement this in a real hands-on way in your university. Next slide, I think. We're close to the end here. I just wanted to say that in general, we did a survey and got some faculty feedback on the community practice and faculty really enjoyed both the in, informal conversations and the relationships that they built, as well as those hands-on practices that they could implement in their classrooms right away. I think that's it for us. All right, thank you so much, Kim and Tanya, for those insights. So I'm hearing some themes uh, carrying out in terms of faculty involvement and engagement uh, through these presentations. And I know this will likely continue on scaling efforts as well. Um, Ryan, feel free to go ahead and get started. Hi, uh, so as mentioned before, I'm Dr. Ryan Luke from the University of Louisville, and uh, I want to talk about some of the issues that we have with scaling projects like this, but um, really we can take some of this and, and apply it to all projects that we're trying to, to scale. And just to give you some background about what we did at the University of Louisville, um, when we began the project, we had uh, two courses with two faculty in two separate departments. And we that was covering about 400 enrollments that we started using adaptive learning on. And then three years after doing some scaling practice and trying to, to improve how we're doing it at the University of Louisville, we ended up with 57 courses in 22 different disciplines um, with 86 faculty, and we were reaching 14,000 of our enrollments. Um, but in that process, we also created and developed workshops on uh, course design, and, and they were well attended, where we were getting 80 and 90 faculty showing up for these uh, programs that we were doing. Oh, you can go to the next slide. Thank you. So the, the, one of the biggest things that I, I can't say enough, I, I want you to see I chose some very simple, plain language in my slides that don't have a whole lot here. This is one of the most important things that I think that you can recognize is that you need to talk to the people doing the work. Um, far too often in the university system, uh, administration or someone comes up with an idea or the shiny new object, and it gets passed down and told to faculty, this is what we're going to do to try to improve this thing. And um, it, it just can't be effective if you're not talking to the people that you expect to do the implementation or talking to the people that are actually doing the work on the ground. It's very important that we are involving them in the process from the very beginning. It's important that um, their, their voice and opinion is validated. Um, and many times they're willing to get on board with the project, but they have a lot that they can contribute from the beginning. So that uh, something that, that Chuck said earlier, after you get to this level, it's hard to build an infrastructure that works. So if you're involving the people that are doing the work in the beginning, you build that infrastructure from the beginning. So um, it's not just in the beginning, but throughout and at the end of every phase, you need to speak to and listen to those people executing the plan. Um, for us, it's no longer a shiny new object to talk about adaptive courseware, but I would argue that across the country, Adaptive courseware is still a shiny new object for a lot of faculty. Okay, next slide. So then it's important that we identify our stakeholders and affected persons because there are a lot of processes, policies, and people on a university campus that get infected, infected, sorry, <laughs> affected by <laughs> um, changing anything or implementing anything new. And, and so we need to involve all of those people. Maybe some of those people are involved from the beginning because we need to talk to them about the work that's being done or that will affect them. And uh, it's also that maybe we need to continually update those people about how the program is improving what they're doing or affecting what they're doing. 
um, you, you need to have somebody that's coordinating or directing that, that work. Um, it might be the faculty themselves, but it, it, there needs to be an indication, a clear indication of who's driving that communication with stakeholders and bringing people together. Who is it that's looking for results? I, in, in another seminar, I, I actually asked the question, whose responsibility is student success? And is it the students? Is it the faculty? Is it the administration? Is it the Student Success Center? And the truth is, is that it's all of the above. So if those results matter to all of those people, then those people need to be represented on these groups that we are looking at. Um, who's doing the implementing? Who's doing the changes? What departments are doing the work? Who's going to be frustrated when they find out? That's an important one that we overlook all the time because we have infrastructure in place. We already have student success centers. We have tutoring centers. We have places on campus that rely on um, the need to help students. And we've just implemented a new program that might affect their work. It's important to get them involved. Why are we not using a new project to increase and, and support our existing infrastructure that's working? And so I, I argue that when you put um, adaptive courseware into a classroom that your, your learning assistants or your tutors, all of those people should be familiar with that platform because they're going to help you make it successful. Um, and, and so I, I just think that we always need to be identifying all of the people that are part of the project so that we can get it to be the best that it possibly can be. When you have success, other people want to be a part of it. Other people see that that success is happening and it's easier to scale. Okay, next slide. Use your new project to support current infrastructure that's already working. So I just talked about that and, I, and just added that as a separate idea that what other places on campus should be involved or could be involved to help you support this work. Are your TAs teaching a recitation class that involves this adaptive courseware? Should they also be trained in the same way that we are using it to identify where our students are falling behind or what they need help with to talk about in, in our main class? But how are our TAs being used? Can they be taught to use reporting? So for example, in my own classes, we use Alex in, in college algebra, but my TAs drive the reporting process to find out the students that they're responsible for, what are they specifically missing? All of my TAs have a group of 30 students that they work with regularly, and they know how to pull a report in Alex, how to go in and, and see which student needs help and how. And so I, I think that it helps that we are involving people that are already on campus. We also involve our tutoring center that works with our students individually after class so that they know what the system looks like. And in times we've even provided a, a computer access in that tutoring lab where students could pull up their individual work at that time in front of a tutor. Okay, next slide. The uh, relationships are important. And I think that, that we all enjoy, we are people, people. People like to build relationships and that's what drives a lot of the things that we do on campus. And so just like I said, it's important to talk to the people that are doing the work on the ground. It's, it's important to feel that same support from administration. And, and that all goes back to building a relationship between everyone involved. I think what Tanya talked about when she was talking about the communities of practice, this is great. And, and you don't always have administrators and faculty in these communities of practice, but how is it that we can continue that communication? What are we doing to help strengthen this, those relationships of the, peoples that, the people that are driving the project forward and helping it be as, as successful as possible? How are they um, being introduced to the administration that are being affected or, or giving accolades out to that. Uh, next slide. Uh, identifying the problems, fastest growing projects are those that meet a need or solve a problem. So if you need to scale something, it's identifying what faculty members have a problem with. What's going on in class? Why is there low um, success rates? What's happening? What are you running out of time in class to do? 
what can we use adaptive courseware to solve? What problem exists um, across the campus? How can we resolve that? If the project isn't working, what's wrong? How can we resolve it? How could we improve it? What changes can we make? And have we given it enough time to correct those issues? Okay, next slide. Um, highlight success. So I, I wanna point out that we have all had a um, opportunity where there was grant money involved and we were able to compensate faculty members. Um, but what we found at the University of Louisville, and I, I wanna be careful here because I wanna put out there that no faculty member should work for free. Um, and so sometimes we're asking them to do a heavy lift. But what we found here at the University of Louisville is it wasn't always about a stipend. It wasn't always about giving them more money just because we needed a project or we needed something to be done. That's nice. And we should do it because we want to show appreciation. But faculty want to see other ideas happening. They want to feel supported in different ways. Um, brag on them report out what's being successful, what faculty champion just accomplished something. When you see a DFW rate change by 20% over two semesters, that's something that should be shouted from the rooftops. They need to be represented or, or talked about in that way. Um, how can we showcase that work? How do we reward them other than just throwing money or, or, or something like that? How is that shown? How can we use them to duplicate their implementation and have that same thing happen in another class. And I, I think it's, it's very important that success can drive your scaling efforts. Um, we, we found a model that worked really well on our campus and we started to push that out to other departments. Here's what this place did. Here's what this class did. Here's how they were able to overcome the issue that you're talking about. And it, it worked really well. Um, and I, I think, you know, we need to think about other pieces of information that uh, faculty consider important. Faculty teaching evaluations are important. It affects their, their bottom line, uh, not just from students' course evaluations, but their evaluations from their department chair. Um, how is it that we are accepting the fact that they just had to put something brand new in a classroom and that's going to change the outcomes of those evaluations? What are we doing to consider that? What about um, issues or, or student reporting? How is that going to change and what, what support do faculty need there? One thing that we've mentioned is adjunct faculty or term faculty. How are we supporting their need when they do something that's passionate about teaching and improving our success? How are we giving them a, a guarantee that they've got a job the next year after they've done all of this work? What are we doing to make sure that that's permanent and sustainable? And I, I think those are all important questions that are the bigger idea than, hey, here's this one time $500 gift for putting this into practice. There's another thing I wanted to point out about Colorado um, uh, State that did this. They, they used these activities of getting people to focus on what the app, uh, adaptive courseware could provide, working in the dashboard. Um, more of like a, a scavenger hunt idea. And I thought that that was ab absolutely excellent. It's a way to get people involved in talking to each other and bringing out some more of those issues that would bring other successes or other things that could be discussed at the table. Um, is this my last slide or? Oh, I, I talked about <laughs> incentives without advancing, sorry. Um, so some other thoughts are administration should be supported from the top down, um, but also, you know, like we talked about from the bottom up, reevaluate uh, regularly, allow time for results. Um, our colleagues at Arizona State says that, you know, we really should be looking at three semesters of implementation um, before we really determine what the results are. Uh, don't ignore problems or frustrations. Validate everybody's concerns. Um, when you throw something new out there, there are going to be concerns. And, and we need to validate those and see how do we move forward? What do we try in order to get something to um, just give it its best shot? Uh, continually record ways that the student benefits. I, I think, um, so I, I wanted to put out there just for my personal benefit, uh, my students, I, in all of my courses last year, I used adaptive courseware, um, regardless of the math class that I was teaching. Um, and I actually 
uh, won an award from student nomination on my response to some of the things that we've done it, with the pandemic and remote learning. And, and so I know that just because we've implemented something new does not have to hurt the way that we teach or what we're doing. There's always a way that we can use that to improve things for students. But those student comments and about how they were supported and about how they felt they were still connected to the class and making progress is one of the most important things that we can highlight. Um, and I think that's all I have. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ryan. Really appreciate you speaking to um, some of these strategies around, you know, supporting students and supporting faculty and how this really is a um, all hands on deck sort of situation. You know, we want to create a healthy environment and community and ecosystem for our students, but also for our faculty and faculty support staff who are on the front line, so to speak, working with these students and doing this very hard work, um, all in service of equity. You know, and we often, um, when we're talking about equity in a lot of these presentations and sessions, we talk about equity for students, but um, not always acknowledging the how equity uh, is, is an issue for faculty too. So you're mentioning TAs and adjuncts and ensuring, you know, some level of security and um, support and resources um, to provide that to faculty as well as they're taking on this important work. Because we've seen when it's done well, it works, but you have to have the right stuff, so to speak, in terms of providing and resources and, and uh, support for those faculty. So um, I do want to open it up. There's a QA and a uh, feature. So folks, you can submit your questions, but I'll kick us off with a question. Um, since we have been talking so much about the role of faculty and how it's so critical to this work, I'd like to invite our faculty who are on this panel to, to speak briefly. What advice would you give, who many of the folks are in the audience today, kind of fall in the administrator academic leadership roles, um, what advice would you give to them on how to best support faculty in taking on this work so that it's successful. Um, Kim, I know you and I had talked about this briefly, so I'll, I'll hit you up first. Sure. Uh, so I would say, you know, in line with what Ryan was saying, I find this, the, there's a lot of satisfaction in knowing I'm doing a great job to support student success and to support and to increase equity. Uh, but the reality is every time I take part in a new initiative, that means I have to do more work at night and on the weekends. Like there is just no way that I can take part in a new initiative and not need to do extra work. And so the extent that it is rewarding is really helpful to make up for that. Um, and similarly acknowledgements, including supplemental pay, but also other acknowledgements help make it more rewarding. Um, but I really think that if possible, give people actual teaching release, give people new TA positions that didn't exist before. Anything that you can do to actually create more time so that fewer hours need to be added at night and on the weekends <laughs> would be really helpful. And as pointed out, a lot of these initiatives, there's a really heavy lift right at the beginning. So it doesn't need to be long term. I mean, it's always going to take a little bit of extra time because, you know, the students are going to send a lot more emails because they can't figure out the adaptive learning platform. So it's the, there is going to be an ongoing increased time spent, but that initial semester, if there's any way to fund this at a level that faculty have actually something taken off their plate, that would be really valuable. But I mean, most of us are more motivated by doing a great job and seeing student success. So I feel like all the things that are currently going on where we have support from our Center for Teaching and Learning, we have um, you know, basically evidence that this is going to be effective. It's enough for motivation for, for a subset of faculty. But if you wanna reach all faculty, I feel like uh, something that acknowledges that actually reduces the time burden would be very helpful. And could I add that we even found faculty to be um, very excited if we could guarantee them they would be teaching the same class the next three semesters <laughs> that they're doing the work on that, which is, is a big, big deal. Yeah. And 
totally a fair and valid request as we know that's not always the case in, in, in some departments, right? Uh, no, thank you both uh, Kim and Ryan. And I, I do wanna note that we are right about at time. So I wanna thank you all for joining us today on uh, the audience, as well as all of our expert panelists for sharing your expertise with us. Um, so I hope you all enjoy, enjoy the rest of your day and your time at the conference and I'll pause there. Uh, Megan Raymond, is there anything else that you wanna add? I see we've got a, a survey option up on the screen now that folks can go ahead and complete anything else you want to note. I just wanted to thank you, Megan, for coordinating this, this conference session and for all the speakers. It was a wonderful session and I really enjoyed the balance of perspectives and experiences. So thank you all for being part of this and we'll see you in the next pre-conference session and throughout sessions tomorrow. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you.